Good morning. Uh, today's Grand Rounds presentation will be given by Terry Germany, Professor and Chair of Pediatrics. He will be discussing the state of the department. Yeah, thank you and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for listening in uh, this morning. And I wanna offer a special thanks to the Children's Hospital leadership who have joined us as well as uh, the leadership of the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Foundation uh, and the Board of Trustees uh, for both uh, Children's Hospital and the Foundation. Uh, thank you all for listening in. Um, I'm excited to give uh, uh, this talk uh, today, uh, my fellow uh, Childrenians, um, the state of our department is sound. And I would just say, even if you're at home, if you feel um, uh, the urge to applaud, please do so. Um, uh, please applaud loudly. Uh, stand if you would like. Um, I, I think there are several uh, opportunities uh, in this presentation for you to do so. Uh, I will call out some members of our team uh, uh, to stand and be recognized as we move through uh, so that um, uh, all can uh, appreciate uh, their accomplishments. Um, I, I will have a, a comments that will take uh, probably most of the hour uh, this morning, right up to the top of the hour, uh, but I'll be attending the meet and greet uh, in uh, a separate Zoom uh, following this uh, talk if you have questions. And I also uh, invite you to join uh, our open mic session uh, at noon today. Uh, that session will be hosted by Dina Hofkosh. Uh, I'll join in too. So if there are additional questions or comments or thoughts uh, that you'd like to share, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. <clears throat> this is a grand round, so I, I do have a financial uh, disclosure to make. Uh, a pandemic is very expensive. Uh, that's my uh, disclosure uh, for this morning. So first, our, our game plan uh, today, we're going to uh, overview our department. Uh, I'll share a little bit about our demographics. Um, I'll highlight some major discoveries uh, that we've made this year, many to choose from, uh, hard to select just a few uh, that I can share. Uh, I'll provide some education, uh, training, and career development uh, updates. Um, I'll laud some clinical service accomplishments that uh, make me especially proud. Uh, I'll describe um, two important uh, initiatives uh, uh, this morning uh, that uh, I've been thinking about hard um, uh, when I reflect on this uh, academic year. And then finally, uh, I want to acknowledge our divisional and executive uh, leadership and uh, pay some thanks uh, to so many uh, who make our department great. Uh, <clears throat> as many of you know, I'm a Stephen Covey disciple, and uh, I like to begin uh, with the end in mind. Uh, and, and truly, uh, our vision uh, for UPMC Children's is to be the worldwide leader in pediatric healthcare, uh, education, and discovery. And I think it's important to emphasize that we uh, seek to lead uh, not because of a particular predilection to leadership. It's because the problems that we're trying to solve are challenging ones. And we need a lot of people working together uh, to solve them, to make progress. And the way to do that is to lead, uh, to bring others who share our passion together, uh, to form a team so that we can um, uh, be um, uh, the provider of the best care for most kids, teach and train the next generation of Pittsburgh pediatricians <clears throat> who go out into the world and do what's right in the care of children and make uh, discoveries uh, that provide hope uh, to kids who don't have it now. Uh, that's why we want to lead. <clears throat> now, who are we? We're a big, big department with 26 divisions, centers, and institutes. Uh, I want to thank Maggie Boss and Jackie Cassidy and Rebecca Longo for compiling all of this information. First of all, uh, we have 336 faculty now in the department. Um, uh, we have 100, uh, 222 uh, clinical trainees, uh, almost 100 uh, research trainees, uh, a significant number of research staff, clinical staff, and administrative staff. And my goodness, uh, we've increased to uh, 1,334 members of our department. Uh, that's an increase of 42 uh, from our uh, state of the department last year. Uh, so uh, we're a big department. We account for um, a little over a third of the entire pediatric service line. Uh, it's amazing. Now, <clears throat> when you look at the um, uh, ethnicity distribution of our faculty, uh, you find that 74% uh, of our faculty uh, identify as white. Uh, only 8% uh, identify as uh, uh, coming from groups underrepresented in medicine and science. 
and only uh, 1%, three members of our faculty identify as black or African American. Um, I, I, I show these um, uh, statistics because I find them sobering. Uh, we can and must do better uh, to recruit uh, and retain a, a diverse workforce, uh, a workforce that uh, reflects uh, more accurately uh, the populations we serve. We're a department um, uh, composed uh, of 62% uh, women, 38% uh, uh, men, uh, our total of 336. And when <clears throat> one examines the distribution of uh, faculty by uh, rank and gender, uh, you can appreciate that um, uh, over uh, two times as many uh, women assistant professors as men. Uh, associate professors are about at parity now, and still um, uh, a few more men full professors uh, than women. Um, but we are a department uh, that skews young and skews um, uh, more uh, toward uh, women. I want to review uh, just a couple of recruiting uh, statistics with you. Um, uh, so we uh, interviewed uh, in this past year um, a total of 65 uh, applicants, um, uh, 44 external and 21 internal applicants. Uh, you can see that um, uh, of those that we recruited, a total of uh, 24 we recruited, uh, and of those 24, uh, 19 were women. <clears throat> so uh, this trend in uh, recruiting uh, 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 women to our faculty uh, is uh, clear, has uh, been clear for the past several years, uh, which accounts uh, uh, to a large extent uh, why so many more assistant professors are women uh, than are men. We're recruiting more women uh, to our faculty. I want to laud some uh, faculty promotions uh, for you, and, uh, and I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Dina Hofkosh, the Office for Faculty Development, and the division directors who have supported these uh, promotions, and uh, congratulate uh, Mark Bruner and Erica Freeling, Jackie Ho, uh, Linda McAllister-Lucas, uh, Awalid Mosin, uh, Kristen Ray Nadershaik, and Tony Partici, all promoted uh, this year. Uh, these are promotions that were effective uh, August 1st. Uh, there are uh, several more that are moving through um, uh, the executive committee, uh, the dean and the provost. Uh, I suspect we'll have at least this many next year and, and probably more. Now, <clears throat> each year I ask the uh, division directors to prepare for me a summary of uh, major accomplishments uh, and awards uh, by members of uh, uh, their divisional faculty. Um, uh, they do a terrific job um, in reporting this information, an exceedingly conscientious group. And I have to say, uh, they told me about um, 80 uh, faculty awards uh, earned uh, uh, by our colleagues. Uh, and they also told me uh, about um, uh, 60 or 70 uh, uh, top manuscripts that were published by uh, members of the faculty. And I have to say it was exceedingly uh, difficult uh, to make some uh, choices about uh, the faculty awards and the manuscripts to share with you, uh, but I'd like to do that and, uh, and acknowledge um, uh, uh, the contributions of our colleagues in this regard. Um, so first, some uh, faculty awards. Uh, I wanna recognize Rachel Berger, uh, who received a Cribs for Kids uh, Woman of Achievement Award. Diego Chavez uh, was um, uh, recognized with a Chef Distinguished Faculty Award for International Achievement. Mike Green won an award from the American Society of Transplantation and Infectious Diseases a Community of Practice. Uh, Elizabeth Hewitt was elected to the American Red Cross Scientific Advisory Council. Sandy Kim uh, received an award uh, from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Uh, it was the Uniting uh, to Care and Cure Award. Sanjay Lambor uh, won the Clerkship Preceptor of the Year Award, uh, one of these awards given uh, by the School of Medicine. And still more, uh, Linda McAllister Lucas uh, was elected to the Society for Pediatric Research Council, a very important uh, position in academic uh, pediatrics. Andy Nowak this year won a UPMC ACES Award, uh, the only uh, pediatrician uh, to do so. Uh, Katie Pollack uh, received the William I. Cohen Teacher of the Year Award from our residents. Uh, ben Miller reminds me that uh, Katie is the fourth in a series of four members of the Hospital Medicine Division to have received that award. Uh, congratulations, Katie. 
Kristen Ray published one of the top 10 papers of the year in pediatrics. Uh, that's amazing. That's a big, thick journal that publishes a lot of papers. Uh, top 10 is a big accomplishment. Amr Sawalha won the American College of uh, Rheumatology Henry Kunkel Early Career Investigator Award. And finally, <clears throat> John Williams received an award uh, from the American Pediatric Society. It's the Norman Siegel Outstanding Science Award, which is given to the single new member of the American Pediatric Society with the most uh, significant uh, scientific accomplishments. Uh, well done. Um, uh, and I just want to say, um, uh, to all of these awardees and others uh, who I hadn't um, uh, had time to mention, uh, what remarkable accomplishment. And now, finally, I want to just uh, uh, call out five members of our faculty uh, who this year were elected to the Society for Pediatric Research. Uh, Brian Canfield, Scott Canna, Jen Marin, Anita McElroy, and Mushmi Malik all were elected to the SPR uh, the SPR recognizes uh, early career investigators in academic pediatrics. Uh, well done uh, to you all. Uh, what a great start um, uh, to your careers. And then I also want to call out five members of our faculty who were elected um, to the American Pediatric Society, which acknowledges uh, uh, more lifetime accomplishments to scholarship. And to recognize Tom Diacobo and Amy Houtrow, Jackie Kreutzer, Mary Michaels, and John Williams. Uh, who were all elected uh, to the American Pediatric Society. And I really think at this point, uh, it would be important to recognize uh, our faculty who are promoted, our faculty who received major awards, our faculty uh, 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 elected to these important honorific societies with a round of applause. Uh, a stand, if you would like, uh, I think that would be so important to recognize uh, our colleagues in this way. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you, may, uh, you may be seated now. All right, uh, I wanna highlight um, uh, some major discoveries uh, in uh, research uh, made by uh, members uh, of our uh, departmental faculty. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the top, um, uh, I do ask division directors uh, to share with me uh, the top three uh, papers that come from their divisions uh, or centers uh, or institutes. Uh, now, some of the division directors are overachievers and shared more than three, uh, but most uh, shared three, uh, which gave me a number somewhere between 60 and 80 uh, total um, uh, uh, to review. I have to say the breadth of our discovery is uh, uh, simply breathtaking. Uh, we work on problems um, uh, to understand how two molecules touch together uh, to lead to the development uh, of a cell or um, uh, perturb uh, a cell and, uh, and gender disease. Uh, we also uh, work on problems uh, in partnership uh, with uh, our community um, and um, try and uh, uh, form uh, better relationships with our community to improve uh, the health of children and families and virtually every single thing in between. Uh, it is amazing. So I wanted to highlight uh, five papers uh, that uh, showcase this breadth of discovery uh, and just tell you a little bit about uh, the findings uh, our colleagues have made. Uh, and, uh, and at the outset, acknowledge that these five uh, come from a total of more than 450 peer-reviewed research manuscripts we published uh, in uh, 2019 to 2020, the last academic year. And again, uh, they were curated by our division directors, and I uh, have the opportunity uh, to present these five. So first, I want to tell you um, uh, a bit about uh, a study uh, that was led by Amanda Pahalik. Uh, Amanda is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Rheumatology. Uh, she directs our genomics core uh, at Children's. Uh, and Amanda has been studying uh, this transcriptional factor, uh, BLIMP1, uh, which in Amanda's uh, a poetic uh, description uh, constrains autoimmunity, uh, constrains autoimmunity. I love the concept. Uh, I chose this paper because uh, it's an important contribution uh, to an understanding of uh, immune regulation uh, and allergen-induced asthma, but it's also Amanda's first, last author paper, uh, which is certainly an important milestone in uh, the career of any scientist, the first, last author paper. 
So <clears throat> what Amanda did is uh, she examined uh, whether BLIMP1 contributes uh, in any way uh, to a, a allergen-induced asthma uh, using uh, mice. And for this purpose, uh, she engineered mice in which the BLIMP1 transcription factor uh, is ablated uh, from T lymphocytes. So these are uh, uh, tissue-specific, really cell-specific knockout mice that lack BLIMP1 in T cells. What she did is she exposed uh, control animals and animals that lack BLIMP1 in T cells um, uh, to uh, antigen derived from house dust mites, which is a common uh, allergic trigger, of course. And what she found after several uh, intranasal immunizations that in contrast to the control animals, in which there's a lot of uh, in, 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 uh, in inflammatory uh, infiltrate in the lung, uh, those animals that lack BLIMP1 in T cells uh, have uh, virtually no inflammatory infiltrate. Uh, they almost appear uh, normal. Uh, this finding suggests that BLIMP1 in some way uh, contributes to an allergic response. <clears throat> she um, obtained um, uh, 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 bronchoscopic uh, lavage specimens from these animals, and I draw your attention to uh, the eosinophil counts, uh, which by uh, percent in absolute number are much greater in the control animals than they are in the animals that lack BLIMP1. Uh, here, uh, BLIMP1, uh, as uh, Amanda went on to show, is required for a signaling circuit that leads to the promotion of uh, allergy-inducing Th2 lymphocytes. And this is important work because it highlights uh, a new mechanism of allergic asthma and may illuminate a, a target for uh, asthma therapy. Uh, this is an exciting study uh, that serves as the foundation of ongoing work in uh, Amanda's lab. I next want to tell you about uh, a study that uh, Linda McAllister and Peter Lucas conducted that was published um, uh, uh, earlier this year in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. Uh, as you know, uh, Linda and Peter are worldwide leaders in studies of how lymphomas develop, uh, the mechanism by which uh, a lymphocyte becomes uh, a cancer cell. And they've been focused uh, uh, for several years on a proto-oncoprotein called MALT1. Uh, MALT1 is a protease, and when it's uh, hyperactive um, and cleaves uh, substrates apparently, uh, those lymphocytes can uh, become uh, lymphomas. What uh, Linda and Peter discovered is that MALT1 um, is engaged uh, by a kinase called G-protein coupled receptor kinase uh, 2, uh, GRK2. And they show through a series of uh, elegant biochemical studies uh, that GRK2 antagonizes the activity of MALT1, prevents it from expressing its uh, oncogenic uh, activity. <clears throat> now, I, I thought about showing you um, uh, the lovely biochemistry um, uh, that is described in their manuscript, but I thought I would um, cut to the chase and, uh, and show you um, uh, an experiment that they did which cements a function for GRK2 as a tumor suppressor. In this study, um, uh, Peter and uh, Linda uh, examined GRK2 uh, expression uh, in um, uh, uh, persons who had uh, this activated B cell type, uh, diffuse large cell, um, large B cell lymphoma, uh, a mouthful to be sure, but a particularly aggressive form of uh, lymphoma cancer. And when one um, uh, examines uh, progression-free progression -free survival or overall survival, uh, what is appreciated is in that those individuals that have the highest levels of GRK2 expression seen in the green lines here uh, these individuals have uh, the longest uh, progression-free uh, and overall survival, uh, cementing a function uh, for GRK2 as a tumor suppressor. Incredibly important work um, uh, shedding new light on uh, mechanisms of cancer, and again, um, uh, illuminating a target, uh, a new um, a target for uh, uh, chemotherapeutic applications uh, to treat these aggressive cancers uh, uh, that take the lives of uh, uh, so many. I want to turn next uh, to the collaborative team of Forno and Celadon. Uh, Eric and Juan have been working together 
uh, for several years, um, making important contributions to our understanding of asthma epidemiology, asthma pathogenesis, uh, and asthma treatment. Uh, remarkable work, um, uh, much of it done uh, with human subjects and populations here in Pittsburgh and also internationally. Um, uh, Eric and Juan have been interested uh, for a number of years in um, a potential function for vitamin D in ameliorating uh, the effects of asthma. Uh, the idea that uh, perhaps in children with low vitamin D levels, uh, if vitamin D could be boosted uh, up, uh, maybe uh, that would um, uh, uh, limit the number of asthma exacerbations uh, that would occur in kids. So uh, in a truly Herculean multicenter um, uh, study, um, uh, Eric and Juan enrolled uh, children uh, with low vitamin D levels, uh, levels less than 30 nanogram uh, per mL. Uh, these would be recognized as low and randomized these children to be supplemented uh, with vitamin D uh, or uh, supplemented with placebo. All these kids uh, with asthma uh, challenging uh, to control. So let me just show you first a little bit of data. <clears throat> On this figure, you can appreciate that those kids, um, uh, this is uh, the vitamin D levels uh, as a function of study week, uh, that those kids who are supplemented with vitamin D uh, shown here in this uh, gray blue, uh, certainly have higher vitamin D levels uh, than the kids uh, who receive placebo. Uh, certainly uh, they did. Um, uh, but now uh, what happened uh, to these children with regard to asthma exacerbations? So now, if you look at the kids with uh, supplemented vitamin D versus those uh, children who received placebo, there was truly no statistically significant difference in the cumulative probability of severe asthma exacerbations. This study uh, is a, a definitive study, uh, which is establishing now uh, that vitamin D supplementation does not help um, uh, to ameliorate the effects of asthma and this is an important finding because it settles a long-standing question in the field that had not been studied uh, in a true placebo-controlled randomized fashion in children uh, and points our um, a focus at other aspects of care uh, for kids who have asthma uh, than vitamin D uh, supplementation. <clears throat> I want to stay on this theme of uh, clinical investigation and share an exciting study uh, that was led uh, by our colleague uh, Silva Arcelanian. Uh, and you all know Silva has been a field leader in studies of uh, pediatric uh, obesity uh, and type 2 uh, diabetes. Um, uh, Silva led a study uh, to determine uh, whether um, uh, liraglutide uh, could uh, diminish uh, weight gain uh, and actually promote weight loss uh, in obese uh, adolescents. Uh, now, I had to read a little bit about liraglutide. Uh, I actually had to learn how to pronounce uh, liraglutide uh, uh, and found that uh, it promotes um, uh, insulin uh, uh, secretion, decreases glucagon secretion, decreases appetite, uh, and in that way uh, can serve uh, to promote uh, weight loss. Uh, let me just show you these data. Uh, these were uh, uh, children, uh, an average age of 14 and a half, with an average BMI of 35 uh, kilograms per meter squared, uh, placing them in the obese category. And you can see that in comparison to uh, placebo-controlled children, uh, those uh, kids who received liraglutide um, had a substantial decrease in weight from baseline. This is kilogram weight loss, uh, down around four kilos, uh, kilograms uh, within um, uh, four months of uh, treatment. And this was sustained uh, during the period of treatment. And in this gray uh, uh, shaded area, this is when uh, uh, the liraglutide was discontinued. And you can see that uh, weight returned uh, to pre-treatment levels, uh, indicating that to sustain uh, weight loss, uh, that the treatment needs to be uh, continued. Uh, I think this is fascinating and suggests now um, uh, a, a pharmacologic means, uh, in addition to behavioral uh, and surgical means uh, to control weight in teenagers and adds uh, an, a new um, uh, uh, potential uh, therapeutic uh, to uh, options uh, that we have uh, to treat children uh, with this prevalent uh, problem of obesity. Um, finally, I want to uh, highlight a study of, uh, of uh, Liz Miller's. Um, this truly is a, is a study uh, that combines um, 
uh, educational scholarship uh, with community engagement. And I have to say, brings a tear to my eye uh, every time I read about it. Uh, Liz and her colleagues uh, uh, employed um, a, a, a gender violence prevention program uh, in which they taught uh, athletic coaches of medical, uh, they taught athletic coaches of middle school uh, uh, athletes um, how to best uh, uh, behave themselves uh, to uh, diminish uh, uh, gender and peer violence. Uh, an amazing study. Uh, they randomized uh, 41 middle schools uh, and en enrolled um, uh, just over 900 uh, middle school athletes. Um, they taught the coaches how to teach the kids and then monitored uh, the children uh, with the primary uh, outcome, uh, positive uh, bystander intervention behavior. In other words, stepping in when a peer uh, is behaving uh, badly. Uh, I'll summarize a ton of data in this um, uh, uh, beautiful paper in a single table, which I um, uh, pulled together from a couple of different columns. Um, what this shows you is that at the end of the uh, intervention, this is the end of the sports season, uh, those who received the uh, training were one and a half times more likely uh, to intervene in a positive fashion. And stunningly, uh, this training was sustained uh, so that there was no difference at a one-year follow-up period. Still one and a half times uh, more likely for the trained students to intervene. Uh, I admire so many aspects of this study, uh, working with coaches uh, to work with athletes, uh, coaching those boys up uh, to become men, uh, truly uh, what our society needs. And uh, I congratulate Liz and her colleagues uh, for this work. All right, all this discovery is made possible um, uh, by funding. Uh, I, I wanna thank Nancy Harder, uh, Paula Hudson, uh, Diane Klein for helping me compile these data just to share a couple of snapshots with you. Uh, first of all, uh, our total research revenue in the Department of Pediatrics uh, in this past fiscal year uh, approached $53 million, a world record uh, for our department. Uh, that's a well done uh, to you all um, uh, for uh, earning all of that support. Um, most of our funding uh, comes from the NIH. And when you add this uh, NIH funding, with our subcontract uh, support, which is also largely NIH, uh, between 60 and 65% of our total research funding uh, comes from the NIH. But you can see that our portfolio is pretty diverse. Uh, we have funding from a number of different sources. And I wanna acknowledge our foundation, uh, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, that really helps us uh, with our research funding as well. <clears throat> there are several awards uh, I wanna acknowledge uh, first, uh, our new K Awards, uh, Allison Silva, uh, Lena Gonzalez, uh, Tom Hooven, and Beth Stinger uh, all received uh, K Awards uh, that are new to our institution uh, this fiscal year. Uh, these awards um, provide for these young investigators a launching pad for their careers. Uh, we can be very proud of them and their efforts for earning these uh, K Awards. We had several major uh, new grants um, uh, this year. Um, I want to highlight uh, three R01 grants uh, received by um, uh, Carolyn Coyne. Uh, three R01 grants uh, new in any given fiscal year is also a world record for our department. Congratulations, Carolyn, for that accomplishment. Um, more uh, important new grants to highlight. And here, uh, I want to particularly laud uh, new grants uh, uh, by Eric Fornow and uh, Eric Forno and Tim Hand. Uh, for uh, Eric and Tim, uh, these R01 grants represent their first uh, R01 grants uh, as uh, the principal investigator. Uh, well done uh, to Eric uh, and Tim. And then uh, more new grants uh, continue also uh, with uh, uh, two new R01s here for uh, Michelle Manny and Mushmi Malik. Again, uh, new R01s, uh, brand new first R01s for these uh, in investigators as principal investigators, uh, incredibly important accomplishments. Uh, I'd like to take a moment uh, for all of us um, uh, just to um, acknowledge uh, the so many research discoveries uh, we've made this year. Uh, we've truly uh, opened new fields, uh, moved fields forward in uh, significant uh, and innovative ways, uh, and we funded these efforts through our hard work. Uh, let's take a moment, uh, stand if you'd like, 
uh, and applaud uh, the accomplishments and discovery of our colleagues. Uh, well done. All right, uh, now I wanna um, uh, acknowledge uh, our foundation, uh, the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Foundation. Um, we couldn't do uh, what we do in any aspect of our mission at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh without the support of our foundation. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Rachel, Rachel Petroselli, uh, the foundation president, and her leadership team, Karen Depperman, uh, Robin Weber, uh, Larissa Graddick, and Greg Keegan, uh, who, uh, with a team of um, 44 people who make up the foundation, uh, work so hard uh, supporting uh, everything we do. I also want to thank uh, the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Foundation Board of Trustees, uh, led by Mark Snyder, uh, who uh, worked so hard for us, uh, helping guide um, uh, the efforts uh, of uh, our teams, uh, as well as uh, raising funds uh, to support our work. Uh, so thank you. Um, this was a, a wonderful year uh, for the foundation, challenging, yes, but wonderful. Um, uh, foundation raised $23.4 million. And of course, um, one's eye moves to the year before our world record year of 28.6 million. But keep in mind, uh, 23.4 uh, places last year in the top three years of fundraising activity uh, for the foundation. And this is incredibly remarkable because uh, uh, when one looks at the year to date uh, at the end of February uh, before COVID, uh, we were on pace uh, to match or potentially even exceed uh, fiscal year uh, 19. And of course, the COVID pause uh, made it challenging uh, philanthropically in part because so many uh, uh, of those who support us uh, decided to extend their philanthropy uh, to families who needed uh, food and housing uh, during this COVID time. Uh, God bless them uh, for uh, making those efforts. But I still find this a remarkable uh, accomplishment. 23 million um, uh, raised from over 30,000 donors. It's just great work. The foundation supports uh, a large number of activities. Um, uh, uh, last year, um, uh, the foundation actually dipped into their coffers uh, to provide 27.5 million, which is more than they raised uh, for um, uh, children's activities. Uh, 9.1 million uh, went to uh, unrestricted uh, uh, support uh, for um, activities like the Centers for Rare Disease Therapy and Child Advocacy, Child Life, uh, Community Relations, and so forth. The foundation supported 1.6 million for free care uh, with the idea that uh, we will care for every child in need uh, regardless of a family's ability uh, to pay. Um, some of our um, uh, uh, foundation support is restricted. In other words, uh, a philanthropist uh, earmarks the funding uh, to a particular purpose, uh, adolescent medicine, child life, endocrinology, genetics, and others uh, received uh, some of that fund, funding. And then uh, uh, there are endowments that support uh, our endowed chairs, but also several other activities uh, at Children's, uh, 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 including uh, camps, uh, uh, the Creative and Expressive Art Therapy Center, uh, various division and programmatic activities, uh, and so forth. It's an amazing breadth of uh, activity uh, that the foundation supports. Uh, Rachel, uh, on behalf of um, the entire department and, and the entire hospital, thank you. And, and thank your colleagues uh, for all you do uh, to support us. I wanna turn now and, uh, and talk about um, uh, our education uh, training and career uh, development updates. Uh, there are many uh, accomplishments to laud. Um, I wanna thank uh, at the beginning, uh, Noelle Zuckerbron uh, and her team in education for helping me uh, with these slides. And I just wanna begin uh, with a thank you uh, to Megan Freeman. Uh, Megan has uh, truly taught the world uh, about coronaviruses and enteroviruses too. And I must say, the only time uh, that you uh, see me on television or hear me on the radio is when I'm spelling Megan, uh, because um, uh, she's always the person who's asked uh, to provide this information. Uh, and I spell her, uh, as does John Williams on occasion, uh, so Megan can uh, do the important research work uh, that she is doing. Uh, thank you, Megan, uh, for being uh, such an eloquent uh, spokesperson and teaching us uh, about these important viruses. We teach um, uh, a spectacular um, uh, breadth of learners uh, at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. 
I'll start with uh, our most junior learners, uh, our um, uh, medical students. Uh, our undergraduate medical education program is led by John Smuziak. And John um, has a wonderful team uh, that he works with to lead our pediatric clerkship, our, our acting internship, uh, our emergency medicine uh, teaching, uh, our advanced physical exam, and of course, uh, our uh, pediatric electives. Uh, we offered uh, 17 electives last year, uh, and these electives um, uh, uh, served as hosts for uh, 50 Pitt students, and 38 uh, visiting students who uh, want to come to Pittsburgh uh, to learn uh, from our uh, experts. Uh, I also want to thank Marlene High. <clears throat> Marlene administers all of these programs so seamlessly. Uh, we couldn't do uh, this work uh, without you, Marlene. Thank you. Um, we have the best residency program in the world. Uh, I know you all know that, um, uh, but I just enjoy every year being able to call out uh, our pediatric uh, residency as the best program, residency program in the world, and it is. Um, our program is uh, so ably led um, by this group of uh, program leaders. Uh, I want to welcome Kate Watson uh, uh, as our new uh, residency program co-director uh, partnering with Andy Nowak uh, to have overall responsibility uh, with the residency and acknowledge the promotion of Jen Wolford. Uh, <clears throat> Jen was promoted from assistant to associate program director and welcome Katie Pollack. Uh, Katie is a new associate program director uh, to complete the team. Uh, what a fine uh, group of people. And I just have to say I admire how they were uh, uh, able to Photoshop their images so closely together uh, during the, this time of masking giving you the impression that they were standing uh, closer than six feet, um, but I assure you uh, that they were not. Uh, this is uh, really uh, a reflection of uh, the power uh, of Photoshop uh, to create these uh, kinds of images. We welcomed um, 41 uh, residency uh, interns uh, this year, 41, amazing. Uh, and this group has come uh, uh, truly from all over the world uh, nationally, uh, internationally, uh, and from Texas. Uh, it's a diverse and accomplished group. Um, uh, uh, I'm getting to know them just a little bit, uh, as I'm sure you are too, uh, and even in this COVID time, uh, how impressive they are uh, and how fortunate we all feel uh, to welcome this amazing group um, uh, to Children's. Our chief residents this year, uh, uh, Nick, Rosemary, uh, Maya, and Braveen, uh, are just spectacular. Uh, I'm so enjoy, uh, so enjoying uh, the opportunity uh, to work with them. And, and I have to say uh, what I admire most um, uh, about this uh, group of four, uh, again, um, uh, grouped in this photograph by Photoshop, not, 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 not together uh, truly in person, uh, is their uh, creativity, uh, their resilience, and their incredible positive can-do attitude. No problem is too complex they can't solve. Uh, no hill uh, too large they can't climb. Uh, and always with a smile on their face. Um, and it's been a joy uh, to work with them. I know you all feel that too. Uh, when you see them, uh, uh, please uh, just whisper in their ear, masked of course, space by six feet, uh, a word of uh, a gratitude. Now, <clears throat> our residents uh, are a discerning uh, bunch. They, they really are. And we get lots of feedback from our residents about the accomplishments uh, of our faculty uh, in teaching. Um, and uh, they rate uh, almost 200 of us uh, with sufficient number of evaluations, uh, we say uh, five or more, uh, that we can rank up our faculty uh, and choose uh, our top 10 uh, resident educators. Um, I have to say this is an aspect uh, of the State of the Department uh, address that I enjoy the most. Uh, lauding our exceptional teachers. Uh, we have many exceptional teachers, but we only have 10 who form the top 10. So please join me in congratulating these amazing uh, educators, Amanda Brown, Sylvia Choi, Jenna Gessner, Scott Maurer, Andy Nowak, Kim Ritchie, Arvin Srinath, Jane Taylor, brand new faculty member, Kate Watson and Matt Zinn, um, uh, the top 10 uh, performers in residency education uh, in the year 2019-2020. And my gosh, we should all uh, take a moment uh, to stand and applaud the accomplishments of our educators, our top 10, 
those who support our educators, uh, and of course our resident uh, educators. <clears throat> Now, uh, our education, of course, doesn't end with our students and our residents. Uh, we have 18 uh, subspecialty uh, fellowship programs, uh, 18, and I want to welcome uh, palliative uh, medicine uh, to this group. Uh, Scott Maurer and his team uh, were successful in earning a grant to support uh, the establishment of a brand new uh, fellowship program in palliative medicine. Uh, well done, Scott, and uh, well done to your team. Uh, what an important um, uh, area uh, for additional training. Uh, uh, fellow education is led uh, by uh, Noel Zuckerbron, uh, Arvind Srinath, and Pat Fustich. And, and I have to say a special thanks to Pat. Uh, she manages an unbelievable array of uh, regulatory uh, matters uh, concerning our fellows, those funded uh, by Children's, those funded on T32 and and other grants uh, and uh, does this uh, also expertly uh, with a smile on her face. Uh, thank you, Pat, uh, for all you do to support uh, our fellowship programs. Before I conclude this uh, section, I wanna highlight uh, some important uh, um, uh, accomplishments by the Office of Faculty Development, um, who seem to make a new logo pretty much every time I present to you all. Uh, this logo and the pick colors I especially like has its own fontanel, um, graphically very pleasing to the eye. Uh, I thank the o OFD um, uh, uh, graphical artists uh, for this work. The OFD makes several grants, and I want to highlight a few of those to you. Uh, they make grants in uh, educational innovation. Um, uh, we like to fund three of these uh, each year. This year, there were so many good applications, we had a difficult time choosing, and so we funded five. And I want to congratulate uh, Aaron Cummings and Karina Lawrence, Annie McCormick, Tanya Syed, and Kiki Torres, uh, all for earning education innovation grants. And to Aaron, Karina, uh, Andy, uh, Tanya, and Kiki, um, uh, great good luck with this work. Um, I hope your research goes very well, and I look forward to reading the papers in which your findings are published. Um, and so thank you for your hard work. I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, Sonica uh, Vatnagar. Uh, Sonica received uh, the OFD Leadership Development Grant uh, this year, uh, and will use these funds uh, to support uh, the acquisition of leadership principles by the Harvard Business School online program, and then uh, take these principles and come back to apply them in her very good work uh, in uh, the Division of General uh, Academic Pediatrics. Congratulations, Sonica, for this important grant. All right, I want to turn now um, uh, to a discussion of our clinical service uh, accomplishments um, uh, and, uh, and just uh, acknowledge with this uh, photograph, uh, Brian Feingold uh, for doing uh, what he does best, uh, examining a young child and bringing a smile uh, to her face. Uh, what extraordinary uh, work uh, we've done in the service of children and families uh, this year. Uh, I want to thank Mike Communal uh, and his team, uh, both the operational and the finance teams that Mike leads uh, in helping me with uh, the slides for uh, this section uh, of, uh, of my presentation. Well, let me start first with um, uh, just a word of uh, exclamation. Um, Yahoo, we're in the top 10. Um, this is a great accomplishment uh, to be recognized uh, in this way uh, amongst all of the children's hospitals uh, in our nation. Of course, uh, the top 10 accolade uh, is uh, critical uh, for our recruiting efforts, uh, whether it's uh, residents or fellows or faculty, um, it's important uh, to be a top 10 children's hospital. It's also important for patients and families. Uh, it helps us with referrals and gives uh, patients and families the sense that uh, they're cared for uh, at a top 10 a children's hospital uh, that engenders well-being. And it's also good for us. Uh, it just puts a little lift in our step uh, to know uh, that we're in the top 10. Uh, that's where we belong, uh, in the top 10. So incredibly well done. And I want to call out all of the pediatric subspecialties uh, ranked uh, by the US News. There are 10 total specialties ranked. Um, orthopedics and urology are also ranked, but they don't count within the Department of Pediatrics, although they're in the top 22. But all eight of eight of the pediatric subspecialties that are ranked are in the top 20. 
uh, beginning with cardiology, uh, led by Jackie Kreutzer and her team, and Victor Morell and his team. What wonderful work, number two in the nation. Uh, unbelievable uh, and terrific. Uh, but I want to acknowledge uh, newborn medicine, neonatology, up 35 positions uh, to uh, number 13, and to thank Tom Diacovo and his clinical leaders, uh, Abir Azuka uh, and Jen Clace, uh, for that wonderful accomplishment. And we also are up 15 spots uh, to number 18 in cancer. Uh, well done to Linda McAllister Lucas and her team. And just to thank her clinical leads, uh, Cheryl Hillary uh, and Lewis Rapkin uh, for that accomplishments. But gosh, uh, 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 look, uh, pat somebody on the back um, uh, quickly in physically distanced um, uh, way uh, for this accomplishment because truly everybody in the children's community is responsible uh, for our top 10 ranking. Okay, now um, just a little bit of um, uh, data uh, around uh, clinical productivity uh, to share and start to uh, see the effect of COVID. So um, uh, uh, Mike prepared for me um, uh, this summary of inpatient and observation unit admissions. And you can see we've been pretty stable around 22,000 for the last several years. And that took a dip of almost 2,000 uh, uh, inpatient and observation unit admissions uh, in this uh, past year. And you can really appreciate that when you look at our uh, average daily uh, census. Again, uh, in, in uh, the last three years, we're hovering around 275, and, uh, and we decreased um, uh, to 247 uh, ADC in uh, academic year uh, 20, uh, average daily census ADC. Uh, we're licensed for 313 beds, so the ADC of 247 put us at about 79% occupancy. Uh, this is really dramatic when you uh, examine uh, the average daily census by month. Again, uh, 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 we're humming along right where we were last year until March, a tiny dip, and then a huge decrease, uh, almost a 40% uh, volume loss uh, in April that we're now starting to recover. And uh, in the months of July and August, uh, we're uh, between 95% uh, uh, and 100% recovery uh, for our pre-COVID um, uh, levels. Now our recovery has not been uh, entirely even. Um, uh, all of the pediatric uh, service lines, subspecialty services, uh, virtually all of them are back uh, to pre-COVID uh, levels or exceeding uh, COVID levels. Uh, our census overall is still not quite at 100% approaching, not quite. Uh, our emergency department has been slowest to recover. And of course that makes sense because uh, children have been cloistered at home, masked and distanced, and haven't had uh, the exposures uh, that lead to the types of visits um, uh, in the emergency department uh, that we uh, anticipate seeing. Uh, uh, I think that with uh, school reopening and uh, resuming more of a sense of uh, a normalcy, uh, hopefully as we put this COVID in the rearview mirror, uh, that that volume will recover. Now, despite these changes in volumes, I, I have to say I'm uh, so um, uh, pleased uh, with our overall patient experience metrics. Uh, you all, since uh, uh, January of this year, we've been uh, above the 90th percentile in top box rankings uh, by the Prescani uh, evaluations. I mean, it's it's just amazing. And I have to say, um, uh, a substantial contribution to these ratings has come from um, a perception by families of enhanced communication by physicians with children and physicians with families. So um, both a thank you and a well done. Uh, keep that up, uh, those great communication skills, sitting, uh, making eye contact, listening, thoughtfully answering questions. It's making a big difference. And so thank you for that. One last slide about revenues. Um, uh, uh, our Department of Pediatrics clinical revenue this year was 64.6 million. Uh, that's a, a decline from last year, understandable with the changes in COVID. It still gives us a respectable uh, cumulative uh, annual growth rate, uh, the CAGR uh, as it's called, C-A-G-R, uh, over the past 10 years of 3%, which is uh, uh, um, uh, reasonable uh, for a health system uh, in this, uh, challenging time uh, for all uh, health systems. Okay, uh, as I'm coming to a close, I want to just uh, highlight two um, uh, major um, uh, events this year. 
uh, that have, um, of course, engendered a lot of thinking uh, from all of us. And of course, the first is uh, COVID-19, uh, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 that threatened to overwhelm us. Uh, but I'm here to say that the Department of Pediatrics uh, has emerged strong as we contemplate uh, the other side of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, it's amazing to me, uh, a once in a century pandemic, how similar uh, our response is in 2020 uh, to the response to the influenza pandemic uh, in 1918. Uh, masks, uh, distancing, hand hygiene are still the mainstays of uh, disease prevention. Now, there are some things that have changed. Um, there are enhanced uh, work from home options now. Uh, our communication devices are much smaller and portable. Uh, we can bring them wherever we are uh, to engage in our work, uh, even when uh, we're not in our offices uh, or in our uh, clinical practices. Everybody on our team, including our patients, uh, have been engaged in our efforts um, uh, to reopen, uh, to maintain a safety, uh, and to provide uh, the care that we need to um, uh, for the kids uh, who need us. Um, I love this image uh, of Mask Up Monday uh, uh, with our children teaching us uh, how to mask. Now, by and large, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, as you all know, uh, the pandemic was pretty mild uh, in the spring months, uh, March, uh, April, and May. We took our uh, distancing measures so seriously that even the tulips in Pittsburgh uh, were distanced. Uh, I took this photograph in our neighborhood uh, by this uh, distance tulip um, uh, with a little risk of uh, tulip to tulip transmission of uh, SARS-CoV-2. But you know, uh, toward the uh, end of the spring into the early summer, uh, things took a turn. Uh, this article, which I'm sure many of you saw, appeared in the Times on July 12th. And there you have it. Uh, young people enjoying each other's company in bars, uh, the root of all COVID evil. Now, this is a rolling five-day average of uh, new uh, COVID-19 uh, test results. I'm just showing you uh, data uh, compiled uh, by Judy Martin uh, from uh, June 1st onward. And I'll just remind you that in the early days, uh, our peak uh, uh, rolling five-day average was about 60 new cases um, uh, uh, in uh, April. And we achieved uh, several days of greater than 200 new cases uh, in, in July, uh, uh, right after the 4th of July weekend. And that's fallen and sort of plateaued to about 60 uh, to 80 new cases uh, a day that we're seeing in Allegheny County. Now, I've shared with you on many occasions uh, uh, COVID-19 prevalence, uh, the impact of uh, the virus in our community and in our hospitals. But what I haven't shared and what I'd like to now is the efforts we've been making at Children's Hospital uh, to put COVID-19 in the rearview mirror. Uh, here are just a few. Um, John Williams was involved uh, at a very early time in January um, uh, surveying uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And of course, uh, John is now leading uh, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Response Office, uh, trying to help keep Pitt undergraduates uh, safe so we don't fuel uh, another outbreak of uh, COVID-19 uh, in uh, Allegheny County. Anita McElroy and her colleagues have been working to develop antibody tests John Alcorn, an expert in uh, respiratory pathogen uh, 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 immunobiology, has been studying mechanism, mechanisms of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And then we've been testing uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And I wanna tell you a bit about our brand new Pittsburgh Vaccine Trials Unit, the PVTU. The PVTU, of course, builds on a long history of infection biology and vaccine research in Pittsburgh. Uh, it involves the collaboration with NIH and other industry leaders with our intent to test uh, lots of vaccines, uh, starting uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the vaccine registry that was established by Judy Martin and Alejandro Hoberman, leaders of the PBTU, now includes 3,704 Pittsburghers, data uh, 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 current to yesterday morning. Uh, and I have to acknowledge uh, philanthropist John Rangos uh, Herbshear, Thomas Tull, and the Mellon Foundation, who all gave us grants uh, to establish uh, the PBTU. Uh, the PBTU has a sponsor team of 17 uh, people that come from uh, seven different departments and centers uh, from throughout uh, the university. 
uh, and we've started, uh, we've started enrolling uh, study subjects in the Moderna trial. Moderna is an RNA-based vaccine um, in which the messenger RNA encoding spike is enclosed in a lipid vesicle. Um, it's one of five vaccines uh, as part of the Warp Speed program. Um, uh, the PBTU is enrolling 250 uh, study subjects. Uh, Judy tells me that uh, as of yesterday, we had enrolled 174 uh, study subjects and we have uh, the remainder scheduled, so we'll achieve our target of 250 uh, to complete uh, the phase three trial that in total will enroll 30,000. And we're on track as a nation to complete that enrollment uh, before the end of this month, uh, remarkable. And here, um, uh, the endpoints are safety, immune genicity, in other words, whether the vaccines elicit an antibody response, and efficacy, uh, whether the vaccine works. It is going to take us uh, some time to sort this out. Uh, safety signals uh, sometimes take time to develop, and we're not going to know whether the vaccine works until there are enough infections in the placebo group and the vaccine group so that we can compare one with the other to see if vaccine prevented uh, acquisition of new infections. But I am so proud of my colleagues in the Pittsburgh Vaccine Trials Unit for being out front, uh, evaluating in a phase three, the very first uh, product, um, and um, I'm grateful uh, to them and their efforts uh, to do everything they can to put the COVID uh, in the rearview mirror. The second um, a key shaping focus um, uh, for this year uh, has been uh, for us a renewed commitment uh, to diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Uh, this work uh, in large part was uh, catalyzed by uh, the murder of George Floyd uh, and a conviction uh, that we can uh, and we must uh, do better. Um, and I've been thinking very hard uh, about our, our efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I just want to share a, a couple of new uh, developments. First of all, um, I congratulate uh, Loretta Mateo and Sylvia Owusu Ansa, our new vice chair and associate vice chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Department of Pediatrics. These are exceedingly important leadership appointments for our uh, department, our hospital, uh, our university, our institution. And I'm looking forward to working uh, with Loretta and Sylvia on these uh, initiatives uh, and so grateful uh, that they stepped up uh, to take on these responsibilities. At a very high level, uh, and Sylvia and uh, Loretta will be briefing us uh, uh, within two weeks uh, at our upcoming faculty meeting about uh, uh, their uh, beginning efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, their focus is on recruiting uh, at all levels uh, in our um, uh, uh, departmental team, on our culture, uh, uh, starting with an external review, uh, but also to incorporate implicit bias and anti-racism training uh, to help us with shared re readings and engagement around these subjects and to help us turn a lens outwardly to our community, our broader Pittsburgh community and our community uh, here in Lawrenceville. You've been briefed um, uh, about the Pittsburgh study on numerous occasions, our community partnered uh, longitudinal uh, study of the influences, uh, biologic and social influences of child health and thriving, uh, truly how the children of Pittsburgh uh, can help uh, teach the children of the world about the most important influences of health and thriving. But I want to talk for a moment about the Arsenal Middle School and work that our department and hospital uh, intends to do at Arsenal. Now, Arsenal Middle School is uh, located on 40th Street, uh, just north of uh, Butler Avenue. Um, uh, you pass it uh, if uh, you leave uh, children's on the way to the airport or if you commute that area um, uh, every day. Um, it's an amazing place. Uh, uh, Arsenal uh, enrolls about 90% uh, of children uh, come from uh, communities uh, that are black and brown, 90% um, uh, from minority communities. Uh, in an effort led by Kiki Torres, uh, Sylvia Awusu Ansa, and Noel Zuckerbron, uh, we intend uh, in the Department of Pediatrics and at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh to form a longitudinal partnership uh, with Arsenal leadership to establish integrated um, a mentorship a program uh, for Arsenal students and to expose Arsenal students uh, to careers in science and medicine 
you all, this is our pipeline. Uh, these are our children in our neighborhood and will become our colleagues uh, if we can promote uh, and help uh, their education and show them uh, the opportunities, uh, the myriad opportunities in science and healthcare uh, that uh, they may uh, find uh, as they uh, move through their um, uh, education, uh, training, and career development. Uh, I hope when Kiki and Sylvia and Noel call on you uh, to ask you uh, to help uh, donating an hour or two of your time um, uh, to helping to teach Arsenal students, uh, to help mentor, mentor them, uh, to just share your enthusiasm about what you do, uh, that you'll say, yes, uh, I'm happy to lean into this work. Uh, little that we do is more important uh, than raising up those young ones uh, from the middle school in our neighborhood uh, in Lawrenceville. I'm coming to a conclusion and uh, apologize, I'm getting very close to the top of the hour. I want to acknowledge several people now, uh, our divisional and executive leadership. I'm first to acknowledge Deb Bogan, uh, who left us this year uh, to become a director of the Allegheny County Health Department. And Steph Dewar, uh, who left us um, uh, to uh, join the LPGA tour uh, with Nick Barcelona on her bag as her caddy. Uh, what wonderful leaders. Uh, we are led by a spectacular group of uh, division directors, um, uh, center directors, uh, who truly uh, lead uh, our department. I'm so grateful uh, for their uh, creativity, uh, their work ethic, uh, drive, and uh, their steadfast support uh, of uh, members of the faculty, uh, fellows, and uh, residents. We have a terrific executive committee. Uh, the executive committee is composed of our vice chairs, along with our uh, interim executive administrator, Mike Communal, uh, here on this um, uh, uh, Teams meeting. Uh, and I wanna compliment Alejandro, who has a background that looks very much like the background uh, for his uh, uh, children's hospital uh, headshot. Uh, well done, uh, Alejandro. And thank this great team of leaders uh, for leading the department forward. I want to welcome our new Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs, uh, Jeff Rudolph, um, uh, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Gastroenterology, uh, who joined us um, on July 1st as Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs. Uh, and welcome uh, Noelle Zuckerbaum, uh, our new Vice Chair for Education. Uh, Noelle is Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Emergency Medicine. Uh, Noelle also joined us as Vice Chair on July 1st. Uh, Jeff and Noelle off the great starts, um, and I can't thank them enough uh, for joining uh, our executive committee and our departmental leadership team. A few more thank yous. Um, a great, great thanks to the research administrative management team, uh, so ably led by Nancy Harder. Uh, this group uh, manages our grant applications, uh, manages the grants that we receive, uh, and all matters of regulatory affairs. A special shout out uh, to all of the help uh, from this team, especially uh, Nancy, uh, Diane Klein, Sean Ward, for helping us open research back up. Turns out it only takes a couple of days to pause research, but it takes several weeks to open it back up with a lot of regulatory hurdles. So uh, thank you all for that. Uh, another great thanks to our clinical research leaders. Um, uh, this is a group um, that stands up uh, the vast majority of patient-oriented research in our department an amazingly complex uh, endeavor uh, that we could not do uh, without the work of uh, this uh, remarkable team. I want to thank our clinical uh, administrative management team. Uh, this is the team that Mike Communal uh, leads. Uh, all of our uh, assistant administrators, our practice managers, their colleagues. Uh, this photograph uh, is amazing. It's the cover art for a new album uh, that Mike and his colleagues will be releasing uh, later this year. Y'all may not know this, but Mike fronts a big band, and I have to tell you, his voice is like way better than Frank Sinatra's. Uh, ask him to sing uh, the next time you see him. Um, I have to thank my administrative team. Um, I, I don't have a better group of colleagues uh, to guide uh, the administration of our over 1,300 member uh, department forward. Um, uh, this uh, remarkable group uh, makes possible truly everything uh, that we do supports our clinical operations, uh, our education, and of course our discovery. I, I can't thank them enough. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my lab team. Um, uh, this uh, Zoom pick uh, was taken early in the COVID pause uh, when we had this sense that maybe it would only last a couple of weeks and uh, we could be 
uh, back at work. And um, uh, of course, that wasn't the case. Um, uh, this photograph um, uh, just reminds me how fortunate I am uh, to work with such a remarkable group of uh, scientists. And then uh, reminds me also of the so many scientists um, uh, in our children's hospital community who persevered uh, through this COVID time, um, made the best of a challenging situation, and are still doing so, uh, working, um, uh, masked and distanced, and balancing lots of competing responsibilities as they try and make progress toward achieving their important uh, goals and discovery. And my last thanks, uh, I have to say, uh, goes to Mark Setko. Uh, Mark, uh, the president of UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, uh, you all, we could not have a stronger and more forceful advocate for everything we do uh, to care for kids, uh, teach and train, and to make breakthrough discoveries. And Mark, I'm so grateful to you um, uh, for your partnership in, in leading um, our hospital uh, and department uh, forward. Truly, uh, with you and the executive management team, uh, Diane Hupp, Brian Martin, the whole group, uh, we truly can provide uh, the best care for the most kids. And to that end, uh, this photograph, and I have to acknowledge Jackie Weiser, and you might just see Jackie's shadow here uh, on this uh, uh, map uh, of our region. Uh, Mark and I are trying to figure out uh, how we can provide care to every child in Pennsylvania, more on that to come. And we are in fact uh, six feet uh, apart. And I'll leave you with this uh, last slide. Um, uh, this uh, photograph was taken on June 5th um, uh, at the White Coats for Black Lives uh, commemoration. Uh, it was a sad day. Uh, we mourned uh, the passing of George Floyd and so many others uh, like him. And we reflected uh, for a while on the pernicious effect of racism on those close to us uh, and on our community. Um, but I have to say, um, uh, I left that day uh, filled with hope. Uh, hope, uh, the sense that if we work together and keep our focus, uh, we can forge uh, an equitable society uh, where everyone in our community uh, has a chance to succeed. So I'll close up there, invite those of you who have time to join me in the meet and greet um, and others uh, uh, to join us uh, in the live mic session at noon and just offer a, a great thanks, uh, a great thanks. I am so grateful uh, to you, uh, Department of Pediatrics. I'm grateful to be a, a friend and a colleague. Uh, I'm grateful for this uh, year that we've had, and I'm so uh, optimistic, uh, looking forward uh, to the year uh, that is coming. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you all have a terrific day. Okay, take care now. <laughs>